time, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, I seen those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, welcome. Uh, this is a entrepreneur panel being hosted by the Center for Entrepreneurship and Small Business and sponsored by Metro South Chamber of Commerce. So thank you for being here. I'm Karen Hamilton. I'm the faculty director for the Center for Entrepreneurship, which we also uh, refer to as CESB. And um, the mission of the CESB is to serve as a resource for those with an entrepreneurial mindset and small business owners at Bridgewater State University and in the Southeastern Massachusetts region. It helps students, faculty, and staff from all areas within the university, as well as people in surrounding communities to develop their business ideas into successful businesses and grow existing small businesses. Ultimately, the CESB promotes a sustainable economic and social equity through economic and community development. One of the ways the CESB supports its mission is to partner with external organizations to establish a thriving network of successful entrepreneurs and small business owners um, who can serve as advisors and mentors to each other and to budding entrepreneurs and small business owners. This is what brings us here today to a panel of distinguished entrepreneurs, sharing their experiences with fellow entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs-to-be so that we can learn from each other. Jay Pike, who is a member of the CESB board as well as a member of the board of trustees for the Metro, uh, Metro South Chamber of Commerce, put this panel together. And Jay will serve as the moderator for the panel. And here he is to get us started. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, it's exciting to be here. Um, and um, before we get started, I just want to thank a few people. Um, this was uh, the work of many, many people to to get to get to this point. Um, first off, I want to thank Karen Karen Hamilton, the um, She's a professor here and director of the CESB. She's been uh, instrumental in guiding the CESB in its infancy and uh, as well as forming this panel. The, um, or this, this event and discussion. I also wanna thank BSU and uh, everyone here in the team, especially Vinny DiMacito and uh, the BSU Foundation and President Fred Clark. I also wanna thank the team at the chamber for all their fantastic efforts, Emma and Hannah as well as uh, Chris, who I'll get to in a second. I also want to thank the panelists for their time and their participation today, as well as the Bridgewater Business Association, the Bridgewater Economic Development Office, and Bridgewater Rotary for helping promote and support businesses in the area, as well as uh, Jeremy David and the BSU Investment Club, who uh, may be in attendance here today. Um, so, with regards to Chris Cooney, he has unwavering faith in me. He texted me no less than 15 times in the last three days. He gave me five things to do, five things I had to do. One of them was to show up on time, dress appropriately, and to show up on time. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm three-fifths of the way there. So let's kick it off. And um, there'll be some green sheets that will be passed out shortly. By uh, Hannah, if you have uh, any questions, you can write down questions along the way, and then we'll collect them uh, at the end. So um, I'll just ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Jenny at the end. Just a quick, um, you know, name, rank, serial number. Okay. Then, we'll get, then we'll get into the questions. Eight twenty-three. No. <laughs> So my name is Jenny Mather, and uh, I'm the president and founder of Jam Pet Resort and Veterinary Clinic. And uh, probably I have my business in Brockton. We've been in business for 26 years. Uh, we have over 100 employees. And uh, I started as a person of one. And so um, I'm really excited to talk to all of you today about being an entrepreneur. Thanks for having me. Dan Evans, um, CEO of EMI Evans Machine. We have a mass manufacturing firm in Brockton. Been in Brockton for 40 years. We have about 70 people. And uh, we're looking to grow. We've been growing every year. And <laughs> I'm Rita Mendez. Um, I am um, an attorney and I own a law office 
but I'm also a state representative and I represent the city of Brockton and I also am a real estate broker and I have a real estate office as well. So we have lots to talk about tonight. <laughs> my name is Vanessa Rios. Uh, my business is in nor uh, Northeastern Massachusetts. Uh, the name is VR Tailoring and Dry Cleaners. And um, we I started like 2018. So it's been six years and seven months that I've been in business. And yes, I am here to answer all these questions Thank that you. you guys have for me. Excellent. So each of these panelists from a unique perspective, and uh, they all have fantastic businesses. They're all uh, extremely unique and bring a positive energy to the, um, the area. And um, I'm excited to allow them to share with you everything that they've shared with me today. We'll start off by asking each panelist to share their unique background and how early childhood experiences may have influenced where each is today. Again, Jenny, do you want to pick it up? Sure. So uh, I'm affectionately uh, named the dog lady, and uh, that actually started uh, very, very early on. I am going to definitely champion the fact that if you follow a passion, uh, the challenging times, that whole adage of, you know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. It's not exactly that easy. But what it does is it makes you get up every day and continue to do what you're doing because you love it. You have a passion for it. And that passion started very early on for me. Uh, it still continues to today. Uh, I grew up with, uh, I was very fortunate to have a lot of animals when we were young. Um, I will tell you, it came from extremely humble beginnings. We did not have money. Uh, and, and we actually traveled in a travel trailer for quite a while, but it never stopped my parents from, we always had at least two cats and a dog. Sometimes we had butterflies. Uh, I was always saving everything from squirrels to chipmunks to whatever stray cats there were. Uh, and then we settled in Brockton when I was when I was young until I was 13, and we still had um, quite a few animals. Uh, and it was at that time the whole idea of pets being, you know, the fabric of a family. I'm not going to say it was completely different for everybody, but it was a different time. And but it wasn't different in our family. Uh, but what did leave a very lasting impression for me is that it was. Very difficult if you were a family that didn't have um, such luxuries to take care of your pets. Um, and, you know, any sort of incident was a travesty in our home. So something very simple could be very, very challenging for a family that was basically putting quarters together for lunch. And so early on, I knew that I had a passion for animals. I actually went to Stonehill, sorry. <laughs> but I went to Stonehill, I'm a local South Shore kid. Uh, I actually went to Bridgewater Rainham, even though my early years were in Brockton. Uh, and one of the things that actually hangs in our conference room at the pet resort is my third grade teacher had given us a assignment. And the assignment was to draw our coat of arms as a family. Well, I have an Irish background, so I'm not quite sure that my grandparents would love the fact that my coat of arms was what it was. But... The drawing hangs, as I said, and basically what it says inside is, I was very modest too, Jenny Dwyer, the number one vet, and it had animals in the crest. And so as I went off to college and I knew that I wanted to do something in the science field, I was a bio major, I knew that I was either going to work in human medicine or animal medicine. That was kind of my journey. But the compass always came back to where the passion really lied. And so the crossover in my business, the way that it works, we're now 360 degrees of happy health. And although it's worked through the years to add those things, we do everything from play train doggy daycare, uh, boarding, training. Now we have a veterinary hospital. And all those things still come back to that thread of the family crest that I thought I had it when I was in the third grade and also the very deep seated nature that I wanted to do something that was animal related, but also that could help. And so we have a value prospect in the community and now we do the best that we can to pass all values through to our clients. And so it, you can see where through each 
I mean, this is 26 years worth of story in a business, but it all comes back to I love animals. I like creating a good place to work and I like creating value. And that started in third grade. All right. uh, again, Dan Evans, I was born in Brockton and um, after a few years, we moved to Holbrook. My father worked the third shift uh, manufacturer machinist and uh, eventually him and my mother started a machine shop in our uh, uh, basement garage. And my mother would help out when my father was off to his third shift job. And me personally, as a kid, I was always outside fishing and playing sports. And um, I got to about seventh grade and it was time to go to work. You know, I'd uh, go to school, I'd uh, play my sports after school, and then I'd walk to work. My father's shop, which was in Holbrook, and I would, I was in a sense the janitor. And then I would get out and then I would walk home. And walking home at the path through the woods, uh, Oftentimes it was dark and it was probably about a mile. And I can you imagine nowadays if you sent your seventh grade child uh, through the woods at night, you know, for my, but that was what we did, you know. And uh, so I went off to high school and uh, continued to work on vacations and uh, weekends. But I was really looking for more. I went to college in Vermont, small school, Norwich University. I started out in business. Um, I got introduced in 1983 to computers. It was a lot different at the time. I had never even seen one. Um, it was one of those courses, though, that came very easy to me. I wasn't a great student, but with computers, I just came easy, and I did well. And at the time, money was, um, it was amazing what they were paying people with a computer degree. It was all new. So I switched my major to a new major. It was called Computer Science Business. And uh, it came very easy. And four years later, when I graduated, or three years after that, um, there was more computer graduates than there were computers in the world. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, from $50,000, you know, 40 years ago to now, and then it was, about three years after that, it was about 13000 And uh, so I couldn't do that. So I decided to uh, go back to my father's place of business, which is... Evans Machine, EMI, and uh, just kind of for a year, let me get it figured out, you know, and uh, maybe the economy would change, more computers would be born, and I'll go back to that. But here we are, 37, 40 years later. Uh, I'm still there, and I'm happy I stayed, and, uh, you know, things change. So I'm uh, very happy with my decision. All right, we're glad you made it through the dark path. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I'm, um, I'm originally from Brazil. So when I came to this country, I was 12 years old. So my mom's a single mom with three kids working every job under the sun. So I was really uh, fortunate to be able to attend school here in the United States and learn English. But that was just about what I thought my life was going to be. I never really imagined that I was going to be able to have a privilege to go to college and get an education. So um, when I graduated high school, because I was also going to school and working different jobs right after out of school, out of high school, and you're working until very late at Dunkin' Donuts, that was how we understood we had to survive in life and just really working very hard. So um, when I graduated high school, I was about 18. I was selling real estate and I thought I was making all the money because uh, real estate, it was 2002, 2003, the market was great. So I went to Massasoit. I got an associate degree at Massasoit and I was continuing to sell real estate as a Brazilian at that time. I was the only one, one of the few Brazilians in the state of Massachusetts that was selling real estate. So I was going across statewide just selling houses all over. And then 2008 came and the market crashed. And after I graduated Massasoit, I didn't think I had to continue my education because why? I was uh, making money selling houses, so that was good. But then once everything crashed and I lost my house, I lost everything, just had to go back to Dunkin' Donuts and start 
there because that was what I defaulted to what I did when I was still in high school. And that was what I knew what to do. So I went and I became my store manager and that through that time in my life. And then there was one thing that I had in my advantage. I looked at myself, I said, what am I doing? I'm still young. So life still goes on. So I'll just be an attorney. I'll go to law school because if everything else fails in my life, I'll file do bankruptcy attorney and then I'll make money that way. <laughs> Then I found out I need to have a bachelor's degree in order to go to law school. I said, okay, so we'll find a school that wants to accept me. So I went to UMass Dartmouth, uh, finished my undergrad at UMass Dartmouth. I went to New England Law, became an attorney. I was uh, going to school, law school, working for this attorney in Brockton because I knew I couldn't really graduate from law school with all the bills and go to work for another law firm with very small pay. So I needed to really get on my feet right away so this attorney in Brock really helped me just rented me an office space and just helped me get started with my first clients and just helped me get on my feet and today I ended up having the uh, real estate office and also the law office thank you Vanessa yes um, so again my name is Vanessa Rios I have um a business called VR Tailoring and Dry Painters. I'm the tailor, uh, but I also do uh, customer service with all of my clients. And um, I grew up, in, I'm originally from Peru, South America. So I grew up seeing my mother working very hard. Um, she used to work for Levi's and the Wrangler company. So there was always a sewing machine in my house. Uh, remember, I remember that I was like probably six year old or seven. Um, I used to play with dolls. I actually have one favorite doll um, that I used to like to make clothes for. And every time I saw the machine, the sewing machine, it was a pedal machine, so it was very safe to use. Um, I was thinking I should make clothes for my dolls. And I started that way, seeing my mother sewing, fixing my own clothes, and then thinking of myself, like, why would I, you know, uh, like, I would like to make clothes for my dolls too. And that was like a, a PlayStation game for me back then. We're talking about the 80s, <laughs> going back to the 80s. <laughs> that was my PlayStation. That was my um, my fun thing to do. Um, of course, I used to um, do it while my mother wasn't there because my mother was afraid of me hitting myself with the needles, hitting myself with uh, the machine. And uh, But I used to do it uh, when she wasn't around. And I did it. Uh, my mother was actually surprised of what I, what I was making for my dolls, and um, Cause I, we, I couldn't afford to buy clothes for my dolls back then. Um, so then, um, 10, 15 years passed by. I was still fixing my own stuff. Wanted it to make my clothes to fit it nice on my on me, and I used to do it by myself. And I was like, I didn't know I was good at it, but I was like naturally doing it. Then I came um, all of a sudden. Um, I was here in the United States. My father, Oscar Rios, he brought me here. He's right there, and. He brought me here and then I saw him running a dry cleaners as a manager. And then he taught me a lot of things. Like I, I saw him working as a manager, but also he was running this business as it was its own business. So, and he was always smiling at his business. He was always 
doing every little, everything in this business. I saw him pressing shirts. I saw him pressing dry cleaning. I saw him sewing, doing alterations. And I saw him doing every single thing. And one day he came up to me and said, I have to do everything so when somebody calls out, I know how to do it. So since then, I start working for other people, of course. I work for ben for Wendy's. And I used to work like Wendy's was my business. I started sweeping floors. I was the best sweeper, was the best mopper. And I was the best customer service handling food to people. And then I used to work for all the dry cleaners. And I'm very grateful that I had this opportunity in the United States. Um, I'm so glad that I'm here. Uh, so these people gave me the opportunity to run dry cleaners in Boston. Uh, the name was French Cleaners. And I used to be like, I used to run this business like it was my business. Then my father hired me to run his business in Belmont Dry Cleaners in Brockton. So I worked there as I was the owner of the cleaners, but I wasn't. Okay. But he gave me the chance of handle this store like it was mine. And I think I did great, right? <laughs> so um, then I saw myself owning my own business. So that wasn't easy to start with. Uh, my 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 father gave me the um, the advice, the best advice he could, and then. Um, a business came came up like someone was selling a dry cleaners in Easton, Massachusetts, and um, I was like, my father was interested to buy it at first, but then he mentioned it to me, and then I was interested because he put this on me, like, what if I own a my own business? since I know how to handle everything, because I knew how to press, I knew how to do the tailoring, I knew how to do a little bit of everything. So then I um, I decided to, to go for, for buying this business. So then, I was dealing with, I wasn't in my best economically time. So I need to borrow money from a bank in order to buy this business, right? I was broke. My credit was awful. <laughs> and I knocked a lot of doors and um, I couldn't get this loan. But then someone, Someone appeared uh, from Mutual Bank back then, Dan Trout. He helped me a lot. Uh, he gave me a lot of advice. He helped me with the um, business plan. He gave me the loan, the opportunity to get a loan from this bank. Now it's Northeastern Savings Bank. And I I had the opportunity to buy this business, and um, very grateful. I'm very grateful, and I have to say thank you, thanks to a lot of people that came to my path back then, and um, I'm still very grateful for for them to to be in my life. Um, so these people made my dream possible. And um, I will never forget this. Even though I was broke, a lot of debts, but 
uh, my dream came true. And I, one, I became the owner of my own business one day in 2018, March 18th. And I'm still in business since then. And all I have to say is thank you. Very nice. Those are all excellent stories. And uh, so you, you pointed out, Vanessa, that oftentimes there are advocates when folks start out in business, like bankers, CPAs, attorneys. Uh, Rita, why don't we pivot, start with you. And um, were there any, any folks that were pivotal in helping you start not one, but two businesses that you started? Rita's a serial entrepreneur, by the way. Um, it's... um. It's amazing how other people need to see something in you that you don't see it in yourself. So how it happened in my life, it was not really that I woke up one day and I said, I'm going to own this real estate office, so I'm going to be uh, my own boss and, and own my own law firm. It really is either I had no other way of surviving, which meant I was studying for the bar in um, 2017, and that was when the real estate market was picking back up. And throughout my um, school years, I had to go to school, but also go to work at the same time, you know, raise a family with kids and married. So it was very challenging. At that moment, I realized I need to be able to have some income coming so that I can focus on studying for the bar because at this moment in my life, this is a priority. I need to pass the first time because then the bills will come and, and I couldn't afford that. So I went for my broker's license and then I hired a, a salesperson and I gave all my clients because everybody knew me in the community because I've been doing it for so many years. So the, real, the new real estate person Person that had just gotten the salesperson's license was very fortunate and happy to have all the business coming in. And then I was able to train that person, get a cut, get my commission, but also pay the commission and be able to focus and study and for um, the bar exam. So that was how the real estate office came about. And I'm very happy it did because, you know, as you can see, the real estate market just keeps on getting better. But then once you um, find out the results and that you actually passed the bar and now you soon to be a sworn in attorney, then what's next? Then that's also that fear because you spend so many months and time in your life investing in this goal. And when it really happens, it almost feels like your foundation has been gone and all that you've been really working for your entire life. Now it's here and it seems like it freezes you for a moment. But I had um, an extremely good friend, a mentor. He still tells people that I'm his daughter. Just because he has two sons, and my uh, feeling is that he always wanted a daughter. So I happen to be his daughter. But he's a white Irish American. And it gets people wondering, because he says it so seriously. And people are not sure how to make of that. But anyways... I um, started working for him when I was in law school and I needed all the flexibility under the sun because I was in law school, I was selling real estate, but I still needed the experience in the legal field. And I kept telling him, I said, I want to do immigration law because that's my passion in the community. I want to help my community. And he says, there's no money in that. Go do PI cases, go do workers comp cases. So I disobeyed him only in that. <laughs> But uh, I still continue to do the immigration because that was really uh, my passion. That was the reason why I wanted to go to law school if uh, everything went well in my life. But he helped me get started anyway. So he really offered the office space and the clients were coming in and it just really started and just showing me, yes, you can do it. You can be your own boss. You can start this new area of law that you want to work on. So you really need to those good mentors, the more experienced people in your life that done this before that can just reassure and that tap on the back and say, yes, you can do it. You you can start walking. You were crawling before, but now you can go on your own two feet and things will be okay. So. Excellent. Dan? I had many mentors. Um, you know, I graduated in college thinking I was going this way with computers, and I ended up going completely opposite. And, uh, it's, you know, it's a big lesson when you'll find out later that 
majority of people that graduate with a certain degree that think they're going down a certain avenue end up doing something. You see them 10 years later, and it's, they're not in the same field. But you know, life is about experiences, learning from your mistakes or learning from your experiences. And I had mentors in a really in every avenue um, uh, between my father, obviously, um, he owned the business. Um, he was working hard, you know, the smartest. So I learned a lot of lessons from him. Um, he, he taught me everything that he knew. Um, and then, you know, back in the day, the communications was different. You know, I came out of college with a lot of energy and I wanted to build his business. Um, and I used to run up and down Route 128 and knock on doors to try to get new quotes and orders and, um, and things were different back then. It was if you really wanted a good order, you had to bring a box of cigars on Friday to the buyers, you know, and I didn't quite get that or understand it at the time. And uh, so it, after not succeeding, you know, at the beginning, uh, my relentless energy, I was lucky enough to have a few customers and a few vendors and even a few employees that took me aside and gave me some great information and uh, gave me some good direction. And, you know, I'm very thankful. I can't say I have a mentor, you know, I have so many mentors, you know, that I, I learned a lot from every walk of uh, business, from my, uh, from my bankers, from my accountants, lawyers, customers, vendors, and family. You know, it's really a lot of lessons to be learned and uh, cherished to help what we are today. Thank you. Uh, well, Tamir, uh, first of all, to, to, to mirror and echo what's been said, and I think that this is a common thread upon any successful entrepreneur. It starts out with a drive when you're young. Um, I, I resonate with what you had said in regards to making your business your own. Um, a lot of us start out in the service industry. We know what it's like to grind, to work hard and we enjoy it. It's always about leveling up. How can we be better? How can we do better? How can we work harder? And I think that along with that, once you find your path, for me, when I got out of college, um, I read about doggy daycare in California. It didn't, uh, it did not exist in Massachusetts yet. It was a crazy idea. And I think that's another thing. I think entrepreneurs, like they have these crazy ideas, but they turn to people Everyone's going to, you're going to have many naysayers that say that it's not a good idea. You can't do it. What you do is you surround yourselves or you look for the people that support you, whether it's a parent or a friend or, and then you start to build a brain trust. And when you build that brain trust, to echo what you had said, for me, I knocked on doors at, and I wanted to know what building in Brockton is going to allow me to have dogs in it. And the answer really was no one. <laughs> I, no one was going to let you have dogs. And so I just kept looking. And the Bertarellis, who own a lot of land, uh, and, you know, they they were like old-time farmers. And to look at them, they were in overall jeans, and they looked like they didn't have two cents, and they were millionaires. He showed me a couple of buildings, and he said, all right, you got a good idea. If you can fix the building, you can try it. And so it starts with that. You know, I have to say that I am indebted for that first chance. It was on West Chestnut Street. It was a tiny little place. I was a thousand square foot and a four thousand square foot building. And in three months, they were moving out because they didn't like the dogs. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to take four thousand square feet. Right. So again, back to the Bertarellis. Can I can I buy this? Can I buy this? I have to thank him for unanswered prayers because I wanted to buy that building, and he said no. And thank goodness he didn't, because then it went to other mentors. Um, my CPA, Joe Murphy, um, is no longer with us, but he was always willing to sit down and look at my financials and kind of guide me in the right way. Uh, and you don't know what you don't know, but I think when you're an entrepreneur and you start surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you in financials, in law, in human resources, in business in general, if you're open to listen and learn and you're hungry and you take all the advice of those mentors, what happens is you start to grow and you get excited and then you fall in love with running business, not just the thing you're passionate about. And then enter Dan Trout. And I know that his name was mentioned, but I have to say that I go back to Community Bank with Dan 
And I came in and I drew him a circle on a piece of paper. It was practically a napkin. And I said, I want to do this and I want to buy this building. And yes, I know that it's 2009 and I know I have no business buying this building. And yes, I'm pregnant with my third child, but this is what I want to do. And if we don't do it now, I might never do it because I have two kids under three and I'm about to have my third. And he said, all right, I like your business plan. Show me your financials. And then came score and then came seed. And all of them worked together. And then came the SBA and the chamber and my accountant and my, and it just goes on and on and on. But if you build that brain trust and you are willing to listen to people that are smarter than you as you go, what happens is all of a sudden you have this team of people that are cheering for you and are so excited for your story and for your success as excited as you are for you. Uh, Obviously, I have to talk about the fact that my work ethic came from my parents. So I have to say that they were my mentor mentors as well. The mayor of the city, Bill, at the time, I couldn't have asked for a better champion of every single thing that I did. Every time I went to him and I said, I have this crazy idea and I need the city to help me. Uh, his pro-business tactics and the way that he supported me, I would not be where I am. He actually came when I opened my veterinary clinic, which was an RV in my parking lot. Talk about outside of the box. He came and helped me smash the champagne on the stairs and helped me to launch it. It's about getting the cheerleaders that are going to champion you and that and if they say no, you find a different cheerleader. I'll go back to Bill, Dr. Haddad, a staple in the city, um, veterinarian. When everybody said, you know, maybe this isn't a good idea, he was like, all right. You try it. Good for you. Now he's my client, but he sold the business. Um, I don't want to miss anybody because I'm saying names, but the truth is, is that it is about, you know, the people you surround yourself. Great. And then in the most important, it's your family. My husband is also an entrepreneur and owned a different business. Talk about crazy people, two people owning two pretty decent sized businesses, but what I would argue is what understands an entrepreneur more than another entrepreneur, like we can just be crazy together. But all the way along, he was, yep, you can do it. Yes, you can do it. 2009, you want to buy that building? Sure, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put the money up. 2018, not recognizing, putting the plans up for the building. So my history is West Chestnut Street, 1,000 to 4,000 square feet. 2008, an offer on a building down the street that was 10,000 square feet at what was considered that recession time. Talk about scary. We got 10,000 square feet. How are we going to fill this up? In three years, I was looking for another building. In 2018, we put the plans up to expand from 10,000 square feet to 34,000 square feet, and then COVID hit. So we had broken ground in the winter of 2018, and as the whole world was shutting it down in March, thank goodness we were allowed to build through COVID some of it is dumb luck and some of it is faith and some of it is believing and, and a lot of it is you just don't give up. You just keep going and you surround yourselves with those people. And last but not least, your team. I would not have a business if I didn't have the team that I have. Many of the people that I've been with me have been around for over two decades. My two vice presidents have been with me 23 and 25 years. I have four other employees that have been there over 15 years. The people that you choose to work alongside you are just as important as your brain trust that you make to advise you in business. If you have a team that treats your business like it's their own and you treat them well, they will stay forever. If you don't treat them well, they will leave and your business will fall apart. And so I just, I, I also mirror the gratitude. Like there's not a lot of people that could say they live their dream. Like when I, when everyone jokes and I walk through, every day, I do my rounds and they say, how are you doing? I'm living my dream, living my dream. And some of it's a joke because some days are not great, but for the most part, I'm living my dream. And, but you share that with the people and you share all those kudos and, you know, and Dan, I have to say, like, I am so grateful to you. I mean, you have made a huge impact in our business and in my life. Oh. Thank you, Jenny. That's you. inspiring. Very nice to hear. And for those of you who aren't aware, Dan Trout is with us in the audience today. Well, <laughs> no, I didn't point it out by two panelists. So, Dan, do you want to chime in on challenges, some of the keys to your success, and 
if possible, highlight some of the programs. Score, SBA. Yeah. Um, challenges. College courses that were instrumental. That's right. Challenges for us were uh, was timing for me because um, thirty plus years ago they opened up NAFTA, which was opening up the borders to allow manufacturing to be done. In the United States, was the king, king of manufacturing for forever, and then uh, with the NAFTA, it opened up to Canada and Mexico. And Mexico became a quick, uh, quickly became a place to go to get things manufactured a lot cheaper than could be made in the States. And then it expanded over to India and then uh, China cleaned our clock. And for many years, um, we couldn't compete. And a lot of, in Brockton where we are, I mean, there was a machine shop on every third corner. And through those years, uh, a lot of people went out of business because the profit margin was so minimal that a lot, and most of the people were older. Um, so to reinvest into business or technology, if you're not, you're gonna be stagnant. You have to reinvest. And um, it was tough. So I, my team and I, um, we decided we had to reinvest and we became much more efficient at things and we were allowed to uh, manufacture our products at a much more competitive advantage than everyone we were competing against. So the now that the government has put out this reshoring and they're putting tariffs up for incoming products, a lot of manufacturing is coming back to the states. So, you know, our big challenge is that manufacturers we're not being made. When I was growing up, manufacturers, everybody, every street had someone that was a machinist. So, um, but I do tours at our place now, and I ask the kids, how many of you have a manufacturer in your home? A machinist. And they just look at me. They don't even understand the terminology. Because most of these kids are born of a generation that were absent of manufacturing also. So, um, unfortunately for a lot of people, they went out of business or retired. Um, and those that survive now that there is the effort through the government and education, there's a lot of money being spent at the state and federal level for education. I mean, they have a program here at BSU. Um, they're really trying to educate it. It's a good way to make a living now. Um, we're a lot more cost uh, competitive with the rest of the world now because of taxes and tariffs that were applied. And, um, you know, all the investment in technology that we did along the way has helped us, you know, immensely. Right now, our biggest challenge, though, is finding manufacturers or, or employees that are in that space. It's coming, but it's uh, it's not there yet. You know, so it's really our biggest challenge. Uh, some of the programs uh, we work with local high schools, vocational schools. Uh, we worked a uniquely enabled program uh, just recently and took the first uh, member out of the first uh, class um, and were richly awarded for being able to do so. Um, you know, networking through, uh, we're involved in the chamber. Uh, we were involved in Brockton Economic 21st Century Group. Um, I work with, well, we work with Mass Hire, trying to develop um, programs and uh, uh, give direction, that type of thing. And, and we're involved in all their programs in the receipt, you know, to hopefully get in return good employees. Okay. And I think one of the big thing too is for us, you mentioned a team. Uh, back in the day, way back, uh, I can remember saying to some of the older guys, I said, why don't you teach money how to do it? Because you get two widgets coming out every hour and he's only getting one. And he was a good manufacturer. He goes, why? So he could take my job? <laughs> you know, and that was really the attitude that was prevalent in our mm -hmm. our place. And now I, I got to tell you that if someone ever said that today in my place, we, we would show them the door because the team is so much better when everyone buys in and no one's going to replace anyone because they're educating. We want everyone to be an all-star. And the team approach and getting everyone to be bought into um, 
we are part of the team. I always say how EMI does is how we do. So if we prosper, yeah. then we can reinvest and we drive the best technology. The people love to drive the new cars. We drive the best machinery. If we can give bonuses because we're profitable, because the team had a good year, if we give uh, we can give raises, bonuses, quality of living, we can have a better place because the team did well. So it, it's really uh, that was a big challenge too: is turn team to make them believe that it's theirs and they have a, a say in it. Hmm. Excellent, thank you, Rita. Do you want to discuss challenges and keys to your success along the way? Yes. Um... Challenges, it really makes you um, stronger because you, you make every mistake under the sun when you're starting out. But as long as you learn from them quickly and improve from it, then you'll do okay. So when I first got started uh, as an attorney, I didn't really have the money to pay the staff and you're just starting out. Uh, so I had my brother as the secretary and that did not work too well. Uh, people people would call me, they're like, um, Attorney Mendes, was that your boyfriend? He seems very jealous of you. I said, okay, that's not working. So we need to get professional at some point because uh, it gets too close when you have family members uh, joining you in a team. So that may not be the best thing to do. But um, as a new, someone that really just started a new business, you want to be involved in every small little detail. So you don't really trust your employees to be able to execute what you've told them to do, even though they are highly qualified, but to be able to train, to show them what to do and let them do it. You want it to be micromanaging them, supervising them, and that takes your focus from what makes it rain like what makes bring in the profit to the business so you're there to bring in the business you're there to be the face you're there to keep the income and the clients happy and supervising making sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do but also trusting them and letting them do what they've been hired to do and that's hard to learn so at the beginning you're picking up the trash you're uh, making sure that this person is doing that the other one and it drives everybody crazy and doesn't flow so it takes a while but once you're able to build the right team uh, in immigration practice you need to make sure that people speak another language i'm brazilian so my clients will, will essentially speak portuguese because that's um the population and the people don't feel comfortable with me. So hiring people that can speak another language, Spanish is a big one too in our practice. So, and nice people, it's uh, immigration. So people are feeling uncertain when they go seek an attorney, regardless, unless it's for uh, real estate, when you're buying a property uh, in general, people are feeling scared. So you need to have um, the people that will be working with you that understands that can be uh, empathy and that will have the patience. So you need to hire the right team. And then when you know it's not the right person, you need to be strong enough to be able to fire them quickly because the longer you drag it, the longer it's gonna be dragging your business down. So it's hard because then you become friends with them and then you start getting to know their families and it's hard to let people go, but it's part of making the wise business decision. So all of these things, the sooner you learn it and the quicker you start implementing, the, the faster the business will grow. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hannah, do we have any questions? If you wrote one, if you want to hold it up, I'll come collect them. Go ahead, Vanessa. Oh, it wasn't, um, of course, easy. not easy to run a business. That question. And um, yes, you have to overcome a lot of challenges. Louder and um, one of these challenges is to hire the right people, right? In order to have a successful business, and you have to trust them at some point. You have to give them to give each employee that you hire. You have to give them a chance to. Uh, to to handle your baby, your business, right? Yeah. So, um, and then 
you also have to get close to your clients as an owner. Uh, I like to talk to my clients. So when I started my business, I actually opened and closed for two years. Every single day I was there between 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. because I wanted to know who were my clients how to handle each one of them. I wanted to know how to handle each problem because a business is not, owning a business is not, it doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect the whole time. Owning a business means that you need to learn about your business. Uh, you need to learn about each client, each, um, each problem that you're gonna face every day. Um, every day is different. Every week is different. Every year is different. You're gonna have ups and downs. And I think having good employees is the number one thing that you have to be very careful with. Uh, customer service. So at this point, I was like having a good relationship with my, all, most of my clients. And I will take any feedback from them. And until today, um, I have the privilege to say that a lot of, most of my clients, they give me feedbacks of all my employees, which are for three of them that does customer service. Behind my business, there is other people, but uh, customer service is the key for any business, I think. Um, it's very challenging to hire people, but you know what? I learn. I learn from a lot of mistakes that I have made. And then um, I I also like to ask questions to my dad, who's been in business for more than 20 years. And he has a lot of experience. So every time I make a decision, I ask him questions. I'm not afraid to ask questions. I ask questions to my family. I, I talk about every every little thing, every little um, problem about it with my family. And uh, that helps a lot. Um, I don't like to stress out about the problems because I, I know I can overcome um, on each of them. It's not easy, but it's not impossible. I think as you running a business, you can just uh, overcome anything that comes to you. And I'm very, um, my biggest motivation, I have to say, is my son, <laughs> who's 19 years old, Jamie, who's right here, right now. He's one of my biggest motivation to keep going and never stop. And I will never stop. I will still here for him. I will still in business for my clients. They love me as a tailor. Uh, they come all the way from Quincy, from Providence. Uh, I have to thank a lot of towns that support my business um, all over Boston. Um, they come to me because they trust me. And the, my but my biggest support is, uh, it comes from Easton, Easton, Abington, um, I would say Rainham, Sharon. I have clients from all over, all over these towns, and I, and I'm very grateful, very grateful for all these word of mouth uh, support that I've been having. And uh, all these um, 
decision that I have made. And I also have to thank God because he guided me to this path. I think he's the number one person who, I mean, he's the number one that I have to be grateful that he guided me to this. And I'm still here. And I'm going to still here for a long time, I believe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Vanessa. So I want to get to some of these audience questions. Uh, the first one I'd like to present to you, Vanessa. Um, I know at one time you didn't have many customers, and you were telling me that you started out with almost uh, very few customers, almost zero customers. And what did I remember you told me the story, but what sort of um, advertising and marketing did you use to regenerate your business? The time we talk, I forgot to mention about enterprise. <laughs> so enterprise uh, newspaper came to my store um, a week after I opened it. So I was very grateful and very blessed, I have to say. They came to my shop. <clears throat> they um, did an interview how I started my business. And they posted on the newspaper. And most of my clients came with a newspaper and my business was, was there. I couldn't believe it. I was there. So that was the number, uh, the number one thing that um, made an impact to my business when I opened it. And then I, um, I also used the post office and I sent a lot of advertisements for all the town of, of Easton and Northeastern, Southeastern, everywhere. I, I made flyers. I put some money there uh, advertising my business. And then I also joined um, Easton Chambers, which was a great move I made also. And I'm still a member there. Um, and I was still a member there for a long time. So um, it's um, it's one of the biggest moves that I made, I think. Thank you. All right, so I think we have time for one more audience question that I'll pose to Rita, Dan, and Jenny. If you could be um, quick, maybe a minute or less each. What is the uh, biggest challenge your business faces um, in your mind today and over the next five years? Um, so what we're doing now, because I've practiced immigration law and that's federal, I've been um, looking towards to expand into other parts of the country. So we just started uh, a month ago in Florida, a new office there. So this is uh, where we're heading towards because there's so much need um, across the country nationwide and it's a, a federal um, so just in this case, because it's federal law, we can practice uh, in the United States as a whole in the country. So we're starting in Florida and we're uh, growing to other places where there's a lot of uh, Latinos, Spanish speaking, Brazilians. So that's great opportunity for growth, but also great challenges ahead. So I'm super excited and looking forward to that new endeavor. Yeah. Um our biggest challenge going forward is obviously we want to grow, uh, continue our growth. Uh, and I think that employment, employees, and advertising to, to get the word out with uh, that it is a viable um, source of income, economic choice. Uh, most of the people, like I say, uh, I, I've gone to open houses before and the kids are all wow and they're all turned on. And uh, you hear the parents say, Oh, you don't want to do that. No. Uh, and it's uh, as they're walking down the hall. So it's it's easy to sell the kids, but it's uh, still tough to curb the parents. So, you know, again, it's uh, what we're doing is we're involved in every vocational school and program, Mass I, MEP, and, uh, and network. We, you know, we network a lot. You know, we network with, uh, you know, with the chamber. We, um, Chris and everybody at the chamber has been great. Jenny, 
and we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, so, you know, historically challenges, because I did want to touch on that, because I think it's important, uh, social media, it's a blessing, as well as it can be a curse. Uh, you know, uh, we've, we've heard multiple times customer service and making relationships. Well, there's no more stronger relationship than uh, a business that identifies with, you know, thousands of families that love their pets that are by all rights, their clients think they're voiceless. So, you know, those relationships, you have to have a lot of trust, uh, longevity. And, you know, I think that if you can build that up on a regular basis and it gets really strong, it combats those one-off mistakes because in any business, there are always gonna be errors. No matter how much you safeguard or how many times you level up and make things processes, accidents happen um, in any business. And so you wanna make sure that you have a level of trust, a lot of transparency, and you want to get out in front of any sort of problem um, with a client that could hit social media to damage reputation. Because if you lose your reputation, you lose everything. And so I think that that's a piece to speak to micromanaging that is a very difficult to let go because you do have to have an intimate hand in that as the person with the name on the business. Uh, so again, social media, a blessing and curse. I would also argue the press. They have loved us over and over and over again. And we have a great wall of fame and also, it only takes one article to create a, a real problem. So you want to stay ahead of narratives at all times. You want to identify things. You never put your head in the sand like an ostrich. Um, the future of uh, J.M. Perry Resort and Veterinary Clinic is to franchise. Uh, our FDD is done. Our franchise agreement is done. And for those of you, that's just a fancy name for basically we're ready. Uh, and so the challenges that come up next is actually finding those people that are vetted out and suitable to be that person. Now, for me, um, the reason why I chose franchising, we're, we're going to do a repeat first. So we'll do a second location that will be ours first for proof of concept on a much smaller level. 34,000 square feet is just too big for someone who's coming in new. So we're going to do a, a smaller version, proof of concept, and that is what's going to follow in suit with franchising. And the reason why I chose franchising instead of repeating buildings after buildings is because I really would like to work with people that are as passionate as I am at the same level that need that chance. And the barrier to entry on that is going to be people that are well-versed in realizing that what we do is not playing with puppies, although it's really great, because one of the biggest challenges is your HR. And so when you get up there, 10, 20, 30, 50 and above employees, you've created an ecosystem where you need all those layers of business. Uh, marketing is a big thing, targeted emails. Uh, you know, I could go on and you said to keep it brief, so I'll stop. But, um, but, but I think that, you know, challenge wise for us, it's gonna be going to the next level, much like you Rita is, it's uncharted territory, but that's what's make it exciting. And that's what's makes an entrepreneur is they're always looking for like the next thing to do. You master this, and it's like, what can I do next? And so, um, you know, it's a great it's a it's a great feeling to accomplish things and then move on to the next thing. If you fail, so what? You move on to the next thing. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a few uh, or send out a few reminders. There's going to be a uh, business after hours at the uh, Rondolo Rondolo Rondolo. I had it right the first time. The Rondolo Student Center in room two hundred one, I believe. And uh, there's also cores of the cyber range, which is just right here, I believe, at uh, 5.30 and 6.30, if you'd like to take a tour of the cyber range. Uh, so thank you again to the panelists. Thank you all for coming and attending. Thank you to Karen. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Vinny DiMacito and uh, ESU President Fred Clark for having us. And final remarks, we have uh, gift cards for the students. If you want to see Emma on the way out. Anna, oh, Anna on the way out. What happened to Emma? She went to the after hours to say. Oh, she, she, she beat Pat. All right. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, I 